everyone, welcome to the latest edition of the Indulge podcast. My name is Sonali and today we have a very special guest. Sarah Curlew is Australia's Consul General to South India based in Chennai. She is responsible for strengthening bilateral relations in trade and investment ties between Australia and India in the states of Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, Kerala, Tamil Nadu and Telangana as well as the Union territories of the Lakshadweep on Andaman and Nicobar Islands and Puducherry. She was appointed to the role in January 2021. In this interview we chat about her life in Chennai, what's on the calendar of the Australian consulate and cricket. Vanakam, I'm Sarah Curlew, Australia's Consul General for South India, and I'm so excited to be talking to Indulge today. So you've been here a while. Uh you came last year. Tell us a little bit about yourself and um you know your stay in Chennai and the highlights so far. My role here is Consul General for all of South India, so I'm the Australian government representative in the five southern states of India. plus the three maritime union territories. Um uh, my family and I came in January 2021. It's actually my second posting in India. So previously my husband and I lived in New Delhi. We were there for 3 years between 2008 and 2011. And when the opportunity came up, we were really excited to choose to come back to the south of India. Uh so we came in 2021. I mean unfortunately a lot of that first year was troubled by COVID. um a very difficult time uh and and the covid restrictions but uh anyway we've really been enjoying it and particularly in this last kind of 8 to 10 months once the city is really opened up and we've been able to travel and make the most of things uh we've enjoyed our time very much i did a quick uh tour of the office before i sat down for this interview and i noticed a lot of vibrant um artworks just just like this one Um does that sort of make you feel like you've got pieces of Australia here with you while in Chennai? For us indigenous diplomacy is really important. So this piece here is actually uh an Australian indigenous or aboriginal artwork. Uh it's called My Grandmother's Country and um what it depicts is actually more like a map of of the earth. So the the different icons that you see within it are depicting part of the geography of Australia and we really want to do more to bring our indigenous culture forefront uh it's an important part of who Australia is as a country and so we we have this piece you saw there's a couple of others uh, done on bark in the entrance way a slightly different style uh and then yeah as you saw down the corridor we have some depictions of different kind of tourist sites across Australia so we do try to make here in Chennai the Australian consulate general feel a little bit like a slice of home are you able to get any of the comfort foods um that you're used to from Sydney um here in Chennai look I, there are two things that i have visitors who are coming from australia bring me the first is vegemite which is a kind of like yeast based spread and the other is tim tams which um are pretty widely known and it's a very famous australian biscuit it's got like a crispy layer with some cream in the middle and then a chocolate coating and the thing is they melt very easily so you have to have someone hand carry them from australia to make sure they arrive in uh, tip top condition okay getting into work mode What on the calendar of the Australian consulate in Chennai are you most looking forward to right now? It's for me a really exciting time in the bilateral relationship. We achieved so much progress over the past few years even during the COVID pandemic. So we now have what we call a comprehensive strategic partnership with India, which is a top rank of our diplomatic relationships. Uh and that means that there's just a lot of focus from both governments on taking forward new initiatives. Uh For us here in the south one thing I'm really looking forward to is that we're going to open a second consulate general for the south in Bengaluru. Uh that'll start it's kind of happening gradually and and by next year it'll be fully staffed up which means we'll have double the resources really just focused on the south of India and that will allow me to go a lot deeper um in the states of accreditation I retain and There's so much to see and do. I you know, every week my team and I are planning the really interesting travel and the trips and the people that I can meet. So, uh I can't wait to sort of delve even further into that. You know, I haven't been to Madurai on this this tour to India for example. Uh also I think, you know, there's just some big things on the calendar coming up. Uh the T20 cricket that's happening here but then also you know back in Australia we're having the big um cricket season in October and November and it just generates a lot of buzz around Australia and India. Yeah, are you a cricket enthusiast? 
how can you be in India and not like care about cricket, right? I am, I, I am a cricket fan and I think it's a really important glue between our two countries. It, it ties us together in so many ways. And actually the IPL has made that link even closer with so many Australian players who come here and participate. But who are you rooting for, for real? Uh, Australia, of course. <laughs> They'd make me hand back my diplomatic passport if I said India uh, in, in the bilateral matches. Um, you know, one really nice thing we've done since I came here is that we had a cricket match uh, for our Anzac Day, which is kind of like our Veterans Day. We call it the Spirit of Anzac Match, and we had it at the Chapok Stadium uh, in April, and that's such a special memory, right? These these two great teams, and and even better, it even came just one run short of a draw, which um, in 1986 Australia and India drew a match at Chapok, a, tech ma a test match. So, uh, yeah, there's so many layers of memory and connection. Do you can you name some players like off the top of your head who are your favorites who you've been yeah, but, uh, you know, for me, I really like to support women in sports. And so, like, my favorite cricket players are actually from the women's team. Uh, Elise Perry, Meg Lanning, and um, Alana King, who, who's actually an Australian uh, team member, but her parents are from Chennai, so that's a nice connection for us too. Yeah. Now, speaking of sports, Australia is a very fit country. Everybody that I know who goes, you know, to Australia, um, you know, for an extended vacation or who has migrated there tells me about how people are, you know, exercising, it's very much a part of their lifestyle. Um, what do you see like a drastic difference between the lifestyle there and here? I, mean, I think you're right. And we talked before about how much I enjoy being outdoors in Australia. And I think we have the climate and the, the natural space that really facilitates outdoor life. So uh, there are differences in my own lifestyle between Australia and here in Chennai. So in Australia, I would often ride my bike to work. Here in Chennai, I always drive in the car because otherwise it's a bit hot, you know, by the time you reach. Um, but I think on the flip side, you know, yoga is hugely popular in Australia and that's something that India has, has given the world and some more of that focus on uh, the benefits of health that come from mindfulness and meditation. So um, both countries have kind of different ways, I think, of, of seeing health. But yeah, I mean, we are 25 and some million people living on an enormous continent. So it means we do really have that benefit of being outdoors and, and making the most of that space a lot of the time. Is there a better work-life balance in Australia? Yeah, I mean, I guess I've never worked for an Indian organization in India. So uh, I think you know, for me, when I think about work-life balance, the big thing that's shifted in the past few years is the impact of COVID and people moving back to work from home. And I spend quite a bit of my time working on women in leadership issues and thinking about how we can support women to have a career and manage that work-life balance. And I think COVID in some ways helped in that people didn't have to maybe commute as much and they've carried that over, but also raised a whole lot of new challenges about um, how do you balance being kind of on demand for your family but also for work at the same time. So I think for all of us we're actually in a phase of re-establishing what work-life balance looks like in, in an environment where work itself has changed quite substantially in the way we do it. So there's been a new, there is a new direct flight from Bangalore to Sydney. Um, talk to us more about how travel between our two countries is becoming more accessible. So I was actually, I had the good luck to be at Bengaluru Airport last week when that Qantas flight touched down. It actually brought a little tear to my eye to see it because it's such a big development to have that first direct commercial flight between Sydney and Bengaluru. Um, the flight time's about 11 hours, which is pretty similar to the flight time to London. So I know people often think, oh, Australia, it's quite far away, but actually, you know, it just makes it so accessible and that will have good benefits for tourism, for um, people who want to tra st study in Australia, travel there for that, for trade even, you know, you can bring different produce back and forth if you've got a direct air link. And probably the major thing is, um, the positive impact it will have on our diaspora community. So now in Australia, we have about a million people of Indian origin, that's 4% of our population, but more than 600,000 of those people, six lakh of those people are first generation immigrants. So you can see how the kind of population of Indian origin Australians is growing so fast. And then for them, being able to come back and forth easily, easy flight, no needing to stop, just makes it so much easier to visit family, to visit friends and to build those links further. So I think we'll probably end up seeing more direct flights. Um, you, you mentioned that you'd been to Western Australia. I know the Western Australian government is quite keen on a Chennai-Perth flight. You know, there's nothing really between us but the Indian Ocean. So 
hopefully a um, bit of a stretch goal for me that by the time I finished here we might even have a second direct commercial flight but still already very happy to have that Bengaluru Sydney link. Now it's been all over the news that ISRO and the Australian Space Agency have collaborated um, so that both countries can grow their space technology markets. Can you give us a peek into what they're working on? Yes, international space is so exciting. I think it really captures everybody's dreams and imagination. So we were the partner country at the Bengaluru Space Expo. Uh, we had a really big delegation, 40 Australian delegates attending the head of our Australian Space Agency. And we signed seven new MOUs for collaboration on things like launch sites and geospatial data. Uh, a lot of stuff that I have to say, as a scientist, I didn't fully grasp, but I was excited to know is going on. And uh, we had a special guest at our pavilion. We had a Gaganru, which is an Australian kangaroo dressed in an astronaut's uniform. And we had the head cut out so people could look and uh, take their own picture as a, a kangaroo in space, which was also very popular. Australian technology that we have is um, Satellites that go out into space are powered by solar cells. And the lighter you can make those solar cells, the better, because they obviously need to be sent very far with rocket fuel. So there's an Australian company that um, makes these solar cells that are kind of 10 times more efficient than, than what's existing on the market. And they're looking to partner with Indian companies that manufacture satellites so that we can together make uh, a better kind of satellite that's, that has a longer lifespan in space. Earlier this year, you launched a five-year action plan for the Australian government to accelerate economic integration between Australia and India. Could you elaborate on this? Yeah, we've had two really big economic developments in the relationship this year. Uh, the first is that our country signed an economic cooperation and trade agreement, essentially a free trade agreement, in April. Um, and this will reduce uh, very broadly the tariffs that are charged on products. So it'll make Australian goods coming into India cheaper and it'll make Indian goods going to Australia cheaper. There were also a range of side agreements around things like post-study work rights for Indian students in Australia, um, some taxation issues. So really what that is is a big signal of confidence in the trade relationship between our two countries and a sense that we should be collaborating on a range of supply chain issues like uh, critical minerals, for example. And then the other part was, as you mentioned, the update to our India economic strategy. That was a strategy released in 2018. It had 10 sector focuses, 10 state focuses, because we know in India you often need to delve deep in one state to really kind of find the commercial opportunities. Um, but things are moving so fast it needed updating. We'd done sort of five years of implementation. It was time to, to set the next set of goals. And um, you just asked me about space. That was actually a new chapter that we added because there's new commercial potential there. Shifting gears into some fun questions. Um, and these are just the last few. Uh, you told me earlier that you've picked up a little bit of Tamil since you moved here. Could you give us a quick showcase of what you know so far? So I did really want to learn Tamil when I came here. Um, you know, a little bit of stuff like Vamakam, Nandri, Epidi Irkinga, stuff like that. But actually, I have to confess, where I use it the most is when I'm dealing with a Swiggy delivery or Amazon delivery. And so I have a set phrase. I say, ah, oh, Swiggy, yes. Konjum wait paninga. And then I say, yanaka tamil teriyada. And that then gives me time to go and find someone who can help me to translate on the phone about what has happened to my parcel. Oh, and you eat it all this in the last couple of months the last year yeah that's right so I had lessons for a while and also my team here are super helpful um, you know teaching me words so like pakalam at the end of the day things like that sweet all right this is the last question but it's a bit of a sentimental one um, now that you've been here a while um, what about India um, that you've experienced since you've been here would you like to take back home with you you know, India has given me and my family so much. There's such a richness to the culture here, all of the different traditions that are celebrated. Um, I think that we will carry back with us that kind of awareness of a culture that's so much, so multi-layered. Um, but if we're talking about actual physical things I'll carry back, it'll probably be Indian textiles. I have a really deep passion for them. I think the beautiful colors, the clever handloom weaving, um, the huge variety. One of my favorite dresses that I wear is actually made from a green ikat uh, sari that I had made into a dress. Um, and then the other thing, of course, is food. 
So uh, it's a goal for me that I should learn to cook really good idlis before I leave Chennai. So idlis more than dosas? Yes, definitely idlis more than dosa. I love how kind of soft and pillowy and comforting they are. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's been a really fun interview. I have enjoyed getting to know you and getting a glimpse into your world. And uh, we hope to have you back soon on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me. I've really enjoyed being here too. All the best to you and your listeners. All right, folks. So that's it for this um, podcast. I hope that you enjoyed the conversation and I will see you on the next one. Bye.